classrooms, which is really cool. And one of the classrooms, this was like, I think it was the third day we went to classrooms. The, the previous days we went, there was about 30 kids in each classroom. Well, this one that we happened to walk into, my group with uh, Debbie and Madeline was seven kids, right? And so when we first walked in, I was like, oh, bummer, there's not as many kids in here, right? And man, God immediately just like pushed me back and, and convicted my heart because that was the best class of the entire week. I mean, that there was, I remember when we were praying the prayer, um, there, was a, there was a girl that was in tears the entire time. Um, and when we were talking about the forgiveness lesson, she just was, was so locked in. And it, man, it just reminded me that, man, our, our lives are going to be different if we decide to let God set our expectations through all the different scenarios that we go through, right? Instead of us setting them and then leading to, you know, disappointment and, and things not working out um, how we want them to. So thank you. My name is Kaya. Um, I, ha I also had a verse that I just came to my mind this morning, actually. Um, Psalms 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And that was something that I really um, struggled with the, before going. Like, I didn't know if it was my flesh or if it was God telling me that I should go. So one of the things I did was, like, okay, I'll just work and save the, save the money in case, like, I get that sign and that peace from him that I can go. And he provided for me, and he provided all the way through that trip and is still providing for me now. Um, one of the things he provided for me is people. Like, I was worried, or I was nervous for the people going, not because I didn't, um, that I didn't like them or something, but that I didn't know them very well. <laughs> so I didn't know anyone, and I didn't have any family going, so it was my first big trip away. And he provided like all of them have made a big impact on me each and every one of them. Um, I roomed with Tessa um, and that was a really huge blessing for me while I was there and while sharing the gospel with little kids was amazing and emotional and all the things. Um, something that really helped me was her because she pushed me. She pushed me to be the best I can be while I was there and she led me to God every single time when I was struggling. So um, I thank you. I thank everyone else that went. Um, and watching those little kids, like, eyes spark up was something that I will never forget. So, thank you. Hi, my name's Rick. First of all, Brownie spoke on forgiveness this morning. I want to forgive my uh, roommate, Brandon, for that picture that he took that I didn't, I, I didn't know about. <clears throat> so, why... <laughs> The other thing I, of those pictures I didn't realize is that my dad went on that trip, so. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> me. <clears throat> Both of us. <laughs> All right. Why, why, why go on a missions trip? That's, that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning. Why, why would you spend a couple thousand and, and go on a missions trip? Why would you take off your, your vacation time that you don't have much of to go on a missions trip? Why would you do that? The, the people in my office thought I was a little nuts. I mean, they know I'm a Christian. Um, we talk about it a lot. But um, why, would, why would you do something like that? You know, I, some of the things that I came up with this morning was, first of all, obedience. We just saw some folks this morning that followed the Lord, and, and, and Brown, uh, Bobby talked about obedience. That's the first step of obedience. Randy had us read a book called Just Ask as part of our preparations. It's about soul winning. Brian Clark, who's over in London, one of the missionaries we support in London, Brian Clark, uh, wrote this book about how to be a soul winner, and the first thing he talks about is obedience. So we were simply being obedient to what God wanted us to do, to step out of our faith. That's the second thing. Step out of, of your comfort zone. That's why you go. Allow God to, to do something in your life, okay, um, to spread the gospel. Obviously, we were spreading the gospel down there. That's another, uh, it was a testimony to, to the guys at work that I work with. They were saying, well, why are you going? Are you going to build something or something like that? And I said, no, we're simply going to do evangelism. We're going to build the church, but we're going to build the people of the church, not the physical building. And so it was a testimony. So, so that, that's why go. Um, 
And then um, the last thing I had was to allow God to change you. I'm going to read an excerpt from this book. He talks about it in this book how that um, being an Internet Christian. Um, he was talking about wanting to go on an exploratory trip to London to see if that's where God would have him to go. And a guy said to him, what can you see there that you can't see on the Internet in pictures? And this is what he says. He, he gives this example. He said, there was a time once... Uh, when we had to take a boat from Italy over to Greece. We were backpacking at the time, so we didn't have a room on the boat. He said, we slept on the deck. We huddled together to keep warm. We tried to sleep a bit, but I woke up mid-journey, and all I could see was the Mediterranean around me. It was nighttime, but the moonlight was so bright that you could still make out the water. Goosebumps crawled up my arms from the breeze coming off the sea. The weather was completely clear, and the water was calm. It was one of those, I can't believe I'm here moments. He says, I can assure you, that moment cannot be found on the internet. You may have seen the pictures of the Mediterranean in the moonlight, but I have felt the ocean mist on my face. Believe me, there is a difference. You can listen to us tell the stories. You can watch the pictures, and they're great. But allow God to do a work in your life. You have to go. Hi, I'm Caroline. Um, I'm going to mention the same book that Rick just showed you. Um, it's a great book. I really recommend it. Uh, several months before the trip, our Honduras group began reading the book Just Ask by Brian Clark to help prepare. One of the things the author addresses is our fear of sharing the gospel. Finally, at one point, I just asked myself, what exactly are you afraid of? I know that I'm an introvert, but I also do enjoy speaking to people. I concluded that some of my fear comes from being a perfectionist, and to some degree, we all are perfectionists in things we care about, whether it's work, hobby, family. I think as Christians, we hold sharing the gospel as one of the most important things we could ever do. So we put this pressure on ourselves that it needs to be perfect, right? And then we say, well, I can't do it perfectly. And then we become afraid to do it at all. Brian Clark dispels this, the, this belief in his book by saying that you have to tell yourself that you are going to mess up, especially when you first start, and that is okay. You go out in partners and groups to share the gospel, just like Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, and that's referenced in Luke 10, 1. And together, our courage grew. The other point that I wanted to bring up from the book is that we don't share what we believe or I believe. We share what the Bible says. Let me explain. When I was role-playing for the first time, sharing the gospel with a partner on one of our preparation evenings, Randy critiqued me and said, for the first time, you did pretty good. One piece of advice, though, don't say we believe. When speaking to someone about the gospel, say the Bible says. So we have another reason not to be afraid to share. We don't have to come up with anything fancy or creative or amazing in our own power. We just share the gospel through verses in the Bible that you can have marked with sticky tabs and highlighter, highlighters. And the power is in the gospel. Hello, I'm Debbie Summers. The verse that was given to me actually over a year and a half ago was, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I know that that is what I wanted to do, is dedicate my life serving God, serving others, being kind, generous, selfless, and volunteering my time and finances. My very first mission trip was with Randy in Guatemala in 08. I continue to go on mission trips pretty consistently all the way through 2018. And as many of you know, my knees became so bad, I was becoming very disabled. I made a promise to God that if I could get my knees done, I would be back on the mission field. I was able to get my knees done and, because I didn't want to be a hindrance to the mission team. 
So last August, I began going to an exercise class weekly. I began to add additional days. And this summer before I went, I was in the gym five days a week. I had to sacrifice, but what I realized, if I don't take care of this body, then I was going to be a hinder to, and not even be able to present my body as a living sacrifice to my Lord. So I have to be able to continue. I'm, as you could tell, I'm quite a bit older than all the rest of the team. So I don't want to be in that point where I cannot give a reasonable service. So I chose not to go last week, because, or last month, year, because I wasn't ready. Um, this time I felt ready. Uh, my son had worried about it, but a week before we, or before we went on the Honduras trip, he said, Mom, you're ready to go, and I know you're going to be okay. So I had that blessing. There were many highlights, able to share the gospel with several young girls and young women. Uh, that was where God took me. Uh, Dwayne, thank you for that song. Because Jesus, your name is power. Your name is healing, and your name is life. And I actually saw some healing. I know last year was a difficult year. I saw some healing with Randy. I saw some healing with that church we went to and the, little, the young girl that the very last night campaign that Madeline and I got to speak to. After she said, I've accepted Christ, she had nothing but a smile, a big smile on her face. A couple other women, uh, she'd quit going to church after her mother died. Your testimony this morning, remembered, I remembered that young lady. It was her nine year. I didn't go out that night with the team. We were on a lot of hills. And I said, I'm just going to stay here and help set up the bouncy house. I can do everything with young children. You don't have to speak their language because you can just get them into a bouncy house. This nine year old came up to me and she goes, Could you come talk to my mother about Jesus? And I said, Do you know English? She goes, Yes, I do. So we went and we talked to, and she was begging her mother to take her to church. Her grandmother had passed and she was not in church anymore. So we talked, I even had a translator come over, the lady said she was saved, but I still pray for her and other young women that God put in my life there. So all I can say is, you know, at this age in my life, I wanna make the best of my life. Um, in my gym now, I'm able to, because you can go on a mission field, but if you don't come back and continue the mission. Uh, one of the ladies that I work out with lived next to um, Mitch Dobson. It was an open area, and I've had many opportunities to pray with some people in my gym. So I have to keep the mission field here, but I pray to go on another one. My name is Brandon Talbert, and I am the heathen that brought the Yankees flag on the trip. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be down here for the altar call after. I need forgiveness from you. But no, it was this is my second time going to Honduras, and um, I just really have a love for this church. You can see the heart and, that they have for the community, and just all the improvement that they've had since we were there from last year. It was just an encouragement to see. Um, Kind of taking it on a little bit of a different spectrum today. Um, there was a lady that we talked to. We went to the amphitheater um, that Rick gave the gospel presentation to. And Tessa was talking to this girl. And she asked me to come over later on and said that she needed a lot of help. And so in talking with her, basically what it came down to is she was struggling with a little bit of a homosexual aspect. But the main thing was she had a lot of depression to the point where she showed us her wrist and she had a lot of cuts on her wrist. And she said she had been struggling with it for a lot of years, had a lot of suicidal thoughts, had attempts, and didn't know why God was keeping her here. And in talking with her, I told her about five years ago, I had a best friend of mine who struggled with the same things, and ultimately he ended up taking his life. And I was like asking God every day, I'm like, you know, why did this happen? You know, you gave him to me as a ministry, he's my best friend, you know, why, how can I use this? And then five years later, out of the middle of nowhere, this situation and I'm like okay so I talked to her showed her in the Bible where you know just because you're saved doesn't mean you're not going to wrestle with these opportunities and in fact these are going to get worse but you have the Bible as a guide to help you you have that personal relationship with the Lord 
to help you through these struggles. It doesn't mean they're going to go away, but you have an advocate for you in those areas. And we had a good hour-long conversation with her, and at the end of the day, she finally understood why she was going through these things and had a new aspect of it. So. I'm Tessa Hake. I told Brandon I was going to try and talk less than him, but I don't know. He did pretty good being quick. But um, so Honduras has a really special place in my heart. Um, I went last year. Um, it's the first place I've ever been on a missions trip to. God made a way for me to go two years in a row, and each trip were completely different experiences. Um, last year, God showed me the importance of answering his call to missions in every aspect of my life, not just saying yes to going on a missions trip, um, but at work, you know, um, at the grocery store. I can get a little upset when people drive a little crazy, but in my car, you know, um, things like that, just the little moments of serving people and being kind. Um, this year, God really showed me the importance of responding urgently to his guidance and how to really carry myself with confidence from him and be in submission to his plans. There were many times that God put an urgency in my spirit to pursue conversations with people at the family festivals and neighborhoods or approach houses with our groups as we were doing door-to-door -door evangelism. And I recognized that this year my response almost every time was to immediately take faithful action, that if I moved as God directed me with confidence in his abilities, he was able to show me the power he holds no matter what the conversation led to. Just like that conversation, I had no fear in just turning to Brandon and saying, I've done this. I can't carry this conversation along much further. Um, God put it in my spirit to call you over. Can you help? Um, without just trying to push through and say something else and, you know, take it over myself. You know, God put it in me to say, hey, Brandon, God's telling me to come get you. So can you come over, you know, and look where that led. It was beautiful. Um, Last year, I found myself um, really ready and willing to be used by the Holy Spirit, but once I was in the position to have a conversation or when the conversation was taken off script, um, I was in immediate contemplation thinking, am I really good enough to even have this conversation? Or I don't know what to say. Someone else could do this better. And then I would just kind of finish up, move on. Um, I caught myself last year having a lot of doubt in the ability of God to work through me. Um, this year I learned that it's not about being more knowledgeable. It's not about being more experienced. It's about moving in faith, about trusting and submitting to the Holy Spirit, knowing that this is his work, not mine. He's going to do it the way that he wants to do it, and I need to submit to that, not the way that I want to do things. It's not about the conversation I can have, but it's about the work that I can allow the Lord to do through me without hesitation. And I know this verse has been tossed around quite a bit. I guess not tossed around. It has been put in front of us quite a bit over the last few years. Um, but Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Thank you. Hello, my name is Madeline. Um, this was my first mission trip, so everything was pretty new to me. I didn't really know what I was doing the whole time, but I learned a lot, and it was a really great experience overall. Um, just a specific moment that I wanted to share was kind of the same moment that Josh talked about was um, the girl in the classroom um, who was just very emotional and just crying uh, during the prayer at the end of one of our lessons. Um, I don't know her or what she was going through or why she just broke down like that, but I think, you know, what we presented, it really did speak to her. Um, this moment really stood out to me in particular because a lot of the students in Honduras um, deal with a lot of the same problems that students here in the United States deal with, you know, regarding, like, 
peer pressure, mental health, just trying to figure out who you are, what you want to do, family problems, you know, the list goes on. Um, with this said, even though we live in a completely different country and culture than the Hondurans, we are all still human and we're more alike with one another than we think or remember sometimes. Um, because we are all human, we are all still sinners and we have all sinned in the eyes of God. One, cu one culture or person doesn't need Jesus more or less than the other. Um, we all need his forgiveness to make us clean so that we can be with God one day. Um, God didn't intend this forgiveness thing to just be for one group of people. Uh, he intended it for everybody, no matter who you are, where you live, what your culture is. Um, overall, it was just, it was really amazing to see God work in the lives of the Honduras people. And it was just amazing that we had the opportunity to reach out to the people we had, we got to reach out to. Um, and although the mission trip may have ended and um, it, that it's finished, the work and the overall mission certainly isn't done yet. And God is still working in Honduras and Central America as a whole. So thank you. your Honduras team. Um, it's a great team this year. Really enjoyed each and every one of them. Um, you know, uh, some people ask, why Honduras? After the, after the circumstances of last year, why Honduras this year? And, you know, really probably, number, number one, first and foremost, people in Honduras still need Jesus regardless of what happened last year, okay? And so that's first and foremost. But the second thing is Jose Volter. Jose and Pei are still there. They're still doing the work, and we love them so very much. And probably the thing that encapsulated that the, the most for me was the morning we were leaving. It had been a great trip. We we're the last team to leave. Um, and I had told the team, you know, you can exchange money into, to their, into the Limpupus. Um, inside joke. So um, you exchange the money. It's hard to get it back into to U.S. dollars. And so I just tell everybody, you can try, or you can take it home as a souvenir, or we can just collect it all and give it to Jose and pay. And I told myself I wasn't going to break down, and I'm going to try not to, okay? Um, and so that morning, we're going to leave, and um, Jose and I were, were in the, uh, the cafeteria eating, and, and the team had given me all their money, and so I, I give him this envelope with a wad of money, literally like that. And I gave it to him, he just broke down in tears. And I broke down in tears, of course. He gave it to, get, went out to the lobby and gave it to Pay. She broke down in tears. And so we're all standing around in tears, <laughs> okay, crying. Um, because we have developed such a relationship and such a bond with that church, but specifically with that missionary. And we just love them dearly. He's a, he's a dear friend of mine, and we love him so much. And so we had the opportunity before we were getting ready to load up on the bus and head out to stand around and just to pray together as, as a team. And that was a very special moment. So continue to pray. Um, I'm going to give you a real quick charge. I don't have the time to go through Matthew, okay? Matthew chapter uh, 28, verse 18, 19, and 20. We all know those. It's a great commission. A lot of times we leave out verse 18. So Jesus said in verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then verse 19, with that we always use, go ye therefore, uh, and now I can't think of how it goes, <laughs> to all the world and preach the gospel. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I'm sorry I butchered that, okay? But you all know what I'm talking about, okay? So, that I'm not following my notes here, and I told the team, follow your notes. Um, so, that is the reason why we go. We can go three ways, okay? We can go by going. This team went. We're going to be taking a team here in about a month and a half to Argentina, be praying for that team. We can pray by praying, okay? And then we can pray by giving. That's my challenge to you today. Mark? Luke 17, short little devotion. I, I know that everyone enjoys this part of giving thanks, having testimonies 
That way the pastor doesn't preach very long. Last week was our 20th anniversary celebration of ADP Sports Park. I have a, a new little shirt on. I'm wearing it uh, for the simple reason of saying, yea, God, again, for the regional missions that we do around here and also with the ADP Sports and what we do with sports, and it's all centered up on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, as we continue to thank God and and celebrate what he's allowed us to be part of in his kingdom work for the gospel in this church. We are going to uh, give the monies away to Plaza Heights Christian Academy, and we'll be doing that at the beginning of second service, and that's a regional mission work where all of you were part of a, a very, very special time. It's over $10,000 that we're going to be able to give to them once again for scholarships. So that's missions, and of course, as Randy spoke of, we are uh, truly believing what God has told us and commanded us to do through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go. And of course, it is the Acts 1-8 mission of the church, the Great Commission, the Matthew 28, Mark 16, everywhere you go. Now, there is a few minutes that we have left to use wisely. So, in Luke 17... It ties together beautifully with everything that has been spoken of, and I thank the Lord for doing that by His Spirit and by His Word. We're just landing here, so I'm going to give you a 10-minute devotion on an incredible passage that could be, as always, preached on for two or three hours, but we're going to break it down a little bit and look at something very simple. It says up on the screen, forgiveness and faithfulness. And in the midst of learning how to grasp forgiveness and grasp faithfulness, there's a statement in here about increase our faith, which the apostles say to Jesus in verse number five. And so, very simply this, as you come off of this wonderful time of a a short-term mission trip, and we have another one coming up in the end of October into the beginning of November, we have the Acts 1-8 conference coming up. And again, this is a beautiful time to celebrate what the Lord has done, the Lord is doing, and what the Lord will do if we would just be in a place of saying, God, give us the ingredients. God, give us the, uh, line us up and give us the, the character traits, the, the direction we need to take to be discipled and to go into this world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage really nails that down. Just, we're going to get two ingredients from God's Word. And that's not the only two we need, but these two work really, really well for us to say, wow, as disciples, will I be a sent one? A disciple is a learner. An apostle is a sent one. We know the genuine apostles in Scripture, the ones that witnessed of what Jesus had done. But you could say, hey, I'm a sent one. I'm a person that's willing to go somewhere with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, again, ADP Sports, Regional Missions, International Missions, our Acts 1A Conference, what a sweet time to really put our attention and our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We should every day, but even more so. Let's read the Scripture. I will give you three Uh, Three simple supportive statements. I won't go through any extra verses. You're just going to have to kind of keep up. So we're going to go New England style, okay? Verse number one, chapter number 17. The scripture says, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him in a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Simply put, it's also mentioned in uh, Matthew's account in chapter number 18 of even parts of forgiveness and the accounting in Matthew's gospel. The little ones, they can be looked at as, of course, our children and the young children. Of course, it's clear, and, and Jesus reiterates that in Matthew 18. But even little ones, consider the Pharisees have been tracking Jesus picking at him and picking at him. He's already dealt with them, chapter 12. I mean, he has dealt with the Pharisees in that, hey, don't mess with the little ones when it comes to even the young believers. And they have been called out because they go after those that are following and believing Jesus, and they want to pull him away. He's saying, woe unto them. Woe. Hey, 
It says 38 times in Scripture, 40, 40 times in the New Testament the word woe is used. Jesus Christ spoke it 38 times in the book of Revelation and the Gospels combined. Verse number 3 and 4. Here we go with the idea that that was the first couple verses about, hey, don't offend. Don't sin against others. Don't be the offender. Verse 3 and 4 talk about you being offended, I being offended. Take heed to yourselves, disciples, he's saying. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and he repent. Forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. There's a couple of tough verses right there. Hey, how much are you supposed to forgive people? Seven times 70 is Matthew 18. Okay, but oftentimes forgiveness and how it's taught. Doctrinally, this is often left out or skipped. What happens when someone says, hey, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'll never do that again. And then they come and do it again. And you're going to punch them. No, you're not. No, you're not. But how are our parents with their children? And how are we when we have a friend or a brother that does that? I'm so sorry I did it again. I, I, I'm working through that. In fact, I've got to repent in my life, and I've got to get this thing right. I need God to work in me because I've been working on it, and I'm working on it. So that's that whole text right there. There's so much there about forgiveness. And, of course, Randy mentioned in the group said that, hey, when they went into the schools, they did lessons on forgiveness. And thank you, God, for landing us in this scripture. Verse number five, I mentioned it in passing. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, sycamore, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey. Very simply, beyond the faithfulness that's coming in Jesus' little parable here about the unprofitable servants and what that means to have faithfulness and on the other book end the forgiveness understanding how to handle forgiveness don't offend ask for forgiveness make it right or if someone's offending you work on that forgiveness comes this incredible part about what's your faith like and what's my faith like we always say that, hey, or we misinterpret it, saying, oh gosh, I just need more, uh, more faith. Or, wait a minute, Jesus said, the faith of a mustard seed, and then everything will happen. And all you're doing is putting it on you. What Jesus is teaching, very simply, is that your faith just needs to be exhibited. You need to have your faith increased by actually saying, God, I'm going to exhibit faith in action, in word, in prayer, and let you do whatever you're going to do. That was all the testimonies you just heard. People went to Honduras by faith. So verse number seven, I'm just doing this as a devotion. I will give you the three points and a poem and we'll be done, but hang in there. Here we go. No poem, by the way. Verse number seven through 10. This is a neat text, again, about the faithfulness in a small little parable by Jesus. But which of you, Jesus being, of course, personal with this parable to the disciples that are his audience having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field go and sit down to meet and will not rather say unto him make ready wherewith i make sup and gird thyself and serve me till i have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink he's saying hey how about the servant that i have that can do it all most masters have like 10 servants to do all the different things. He's saying, what if you had this servant to do all this? You've given him the whole load to take care of. Should he whine and walk away? Look at his principle here that he's teaching Jesus. Is. Verse 9, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. I suppose not, he says. I think not. How does he pull it together in verse 10? So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are profitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. You told me to do something. You hired me to do something. You commanded me. I didn't make a big deal out of it. Brandon, if you would for me, advance to the next title slide where it says forgiveness and faithfulness. <clears throat> So very simply, here you go. I'm going to give you 
the three little spots that fit every time when you look at this idea of doing something that God has shown us, that the scriptures teach us that Jesus has. The first one is on the first slide right here, our willingness. There's a limitless supply to forgive. We say God's got to give us more ability to do it. Wait a minute now. He's already given it to you. You have to be willing and I have to be willing and that's what Jesus is teaching. Think about our willingness. Father chose to send his son for forgiveness. For forgiveness of our repetitive sin while we withhold forgiveness of others. But the Bible says the Lord's not willing that any should perish. First piece of the will of God, I'm not wanting anyone to go to hell. And he says, hey, to show you and prove it to me, my willingness and my love, is the son the one that can forgive every single sin. Two slides later, B. Go right to the next one. The limitless supply to have faith. Remember now, verse 5 and 6. The limitless supply to have faith. It's you and I grabbing the faith from the Word of God, grabbing the faith from what God has done. Listen to these testimonies, increases my faith. I, I'm thinking, golly, because you asked God and He delivered. That's where the increase of faith comes. Faith is a mustard seed. It could grow into something incredible, but God can move it. All the places where you think that it's all about your faith, it's about you having the faith to trust in God's faith. He will be faithful, and that's how you learn about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you could sit there and grab and grab and never, ever act. And the act is to say, God, and so many of you gave testimony of this, I don't know what I'm doing, but I have the faith to go. I have the faith to pray, and I have the faith to give. Please do something incredible. Jesus fulfilled the will of his Father through actions that prove faith while we desire his faith. You want the kind of faith that Jesus had? Back to obedience, isn't it? It is about obedience, isn't it, Tessa? And it's about all of it, but that's a piece of it. Lastly, the limitless supply to be faithful. Here's the limitless supply. See, it's all in the Word. It's in your salvation. I'm talking to you as believers. If you're lost today, you don't have this limitless supply in Jesus because you don't have Jesus yet. You need Jesus Christ to save your soul. You need to call in the name of the Lord to save you. Because it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So many people are trying to pile up their works. Great testimony today in the baptismal. It's about putting faith in Jesus Christ. Just think about our sense of duty. Okay, okay. But he says in this duty part, Paul lived it out. In the proper heart attitude towards servanthood, he did it while we complain over the idea of obligation. Go read the book of Philippians. Colossians, Ephesians. He wrote all three of them from jail. You want to grasp the limit of the supply of faithfulness? Like that parable? It was a sense of duty that Jesus put before us. So I pull this all together with the last slide up on the screen. <sighs> He's the limitless supply that we have. It says, just think about it. Our unlimited supply of forgiveness and faith comes from living like our unlimited Savior and Lord. And the way you learn is from his word, from your brother and sisters, from someone discipling you, from somebody walking with you, and let most of all, your desire to be moved to where you will walk with Jesus Christ. What is the reason for our limited forgiveness? What is the reason why we have limited faithfulness? 
Why don't you stand with me as we finish out? Let's have a time of prayer. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? Debbie, just go ahead and play some music in the background. I'm going to pray with you, and I won't tarry real long, but let me just pray for you. We may take a minute or so in prayer just to kind of seal this all together and talk to the Lord about our forgiveness that he can supply, his faithfulness that he can supply to make us at a place where we have this limitless faith. Father in heaven, thank you for our time in giving you glory. You gave us the opportunity to give you back the glory. What a joy in the name of Jesus. What an honor it is to give you glory. But it is your glory that you give us to give back to you. You gave it all in your son, Jesus Christ. And so I just pray in this time of prayer for a minute or two. I don't want to leave here without giving people a chance to pray with you, do business with you. Let us find a place where we can just answer this question. Why such a limited faith and faithfulness? Why such a limited forgiveness? God, deal with our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.